So assessing lung function can be done by measuring lung volumes and lung capacities. So these are tests that physicians will do to determine the extent of possible lung injury or decrease in function. So for my class, it's largely, you know, knowing these volumes, what do they mean? Uh, when you move on to, say, a nursing program or PA school or a, a medical program, you're going to be probably asked to interpret some of these volumes, be able to measure these volumes by using a spirometer uh, that basically measures the volume coming in and out of the respiratory tract. So I really emphasize the fact that you study this uh, spirogram, it's called. It's basically as if you had a patient hooked up to a spirometer and you ask them to breathe certain ways, and then that spirometer uh, measures the volumes. So if you go through the graph and kind of replicate this type of breathing, the definitions will make a lot more sense. So let's start with this graph real, real quick. So you kind of start here and work your way this way, um, as if this is kind of going across the screen, or sometimes it can be a, a paper output. Um, so it's kind of like you were looking at an EKG that's assessing the heart. We're looking at um, volume changes. So we kind of start right where that arrow says. And if you take a, take a breath and breathe it out, okay, so a normal breath, that volume going in and then out is known as tidal volume or TV. So it's the amount of air inhaled or exhaled with each breath under resting conditions. And it's about the same for a male and a female. It's about 500 milliliters. So you take a 500 milliliter breath in and then exhale. Okay. The next is to take a deep breath. So you take that initial quiet breath and then you inhale as much as you possibly can. So from this point here up until this point is known as inspiratory reserve volume. So that's the amount of air that can force, be forcefully inhaled after you've already inhaled that tidal volume. Okay, so now we're basically up here. Then you can exhale that volume. You can exhale that tidal volume. How much more can you exhale? So that's called expiratory reserve volume. So that's the amount of air that can be forcefully exhaled after you've exhaled your tidal volume. All right. So if you think about this, the reserves are what you have basically on reserve if you need to. All right. So when you're quietly breathing, like you probably are right now, you're doing this. You're inhaling, exhaling, inhaling, exhaling, inhaling, exhaling. Well, what you have on reserve is however much you can inhale above that and then however much you can exhale below that. Okay. Whatever stays behind, okay, you can't completely exhale and completely empty the lungs. All right. There has to be a certain amount of air remaining in the lungs after that forced exhalation. That volume is called residual volume. And then the next breath you take, that air will mix in with that residual volume. Okay. So these are the four major volumes. Uh, a capacity is more than one volume. So notice if we have what's known as inspiratory capacity, that's just where you add together both the tidal volume, because that's an inspiratory volume, right? It's an inhalation, and then whatever you have on reserve. So that's called inspiratory capacity. Then you have what's known as functional residual capacity, or FRC. Now this one is when you stop breathing. Let's say you're here, right? You're breathing in, out, in, out, and then you stop breathing. How much is in your lungs? So that is going to be the residual volume as well as that expiratory reserve volume. Now this one's kind of interesting because uh, let's say you're getting put under anesthesia, 
all right? And the anesthesiologist is going to uh, give you medications that stop you from breathing, and then they intubate. Right? They stick a tube down your respiratory tract and basically start to breathe for you with the instrument. Now, that time between the moment you stop breathing and the moment they intubate, you're basically surviving on the air that's in those lungs. That air in the lungs is the FRC. All right? And that FRC volume isn't constant with everyone. So certain people might have different volumes or different FRCs. And position of the body might affect the FRC as well. So for example, some pelvic surgeries, the person is on an, uh, kind of an incline. So their legs are kind of sticking up and their head is, is down. Well, that's going to force some of your abdominal organs up on the lungs and make their uh, capacity smaller. So anesthesiologists have to take that into consideration. Uh, vital capacity, so that's basically the maximum amount of air that you can exchange during uh, maximum breathing. So that's basically your forced breathing. So your entire volume that you can breathe in and then you breathe out. So that's tidal volume, inspiratory reserve, and expiratory reserve. And then total lung capacity, that's an easy one. That's everything. So that's, you know, everything in your respiratory tract when you, when you take that big, deep breath. All right? So, again, you've got four lung volumes and four lung capacities. Um, the best way to learn these, I believe, is interpret this graph and read the definitions. Um, I'm not going to ask you the specific numbers. Um, the equations make sense. I think it's important to know kind of how these capacities are kind of calculated based on the, um, uh, the addition of more than one uh, volume. And again, this will be important moving on when you get into respiratory care and you might have to be able to analyze uh, these, these results. All right, next topic is... Um, there's a couple, there's a few topics here. We've got the topic of gas exchange. We also have the topic of transport of the gases. So this is a, a, a pretty important figure with a lot of components. So we're going to go nice and slow through this process. Um, and it's going to be kind of a story where we're inhaling air, uh, what happens next, so on and so on and so on. So basically, how you go through this figure is you start here. So this is atmospheric air, okay? Air in the atmosphere has a certain amount of oxygen, okay? That number is 160 millimeters mercury. So if you looked way back when we talked about uh, partial pressures, uh, that's the amount of oxygen in the atmosphere. Uh, carbon dioxide was 0 0.3 millimeters mercury. All right, so those are the partial pressures of the two gases in the atmosphere. Okay, now remember the biggest number was for nitrogen, but we don't really care about nitrogen. We're focusing on the oxygen and the carbon dioxide. Humans get nitrogen from the food we eat. Uh, we don't obtain the nitrogen from the, from the atmosphere. So this is the air that gets brought into your lungs, okay? Now, what happens to that air? Well, it's gonna mix with the residual volume. So things are gonna change. These numbers change because you're mixing it with some air that's still in the lungs from the, at the end of the previous breath. That air probably was very rich in carbon dioxide and was probably low in oxygen, right? Because you did the gas exchange with that air. So the oxygen number, you'll notice, is going to go down. The carbon dioxide number actually goes up because you get this mixing of the atmospheric air with that residual volume. You also humidify. So adding moisture to the air will also kind of affect these numbers. So the air that's actually in your lungs is not the same as the atmosphere because it has changed by the time it gets into your lungs okay so now we have alveolar air so this is the air 
that we're going to have in the alveoli that we're going to do gas exchange with the blood that's entering the pulmonary capillary. All right, so there's that interface between the alveolus and the deoxygenated blood in the pulmonary capillary. Now, what are the pressures of the two gases there? So in deoxygenated blood, there's about 40 millimeters mercury of oxygen and 45 of carbon dioxide, okay? So comparing these numbers with these numbers will explain why you can have gas exchange, okay? Now, gas exchange is diffusion. And remember what causes diffusion. It is a concentration, or in this case, pressure gradient. Okay, so the oxygen, because it's high in the alveolus, 104, and low in the deoxygenated blood, is going to diffuse into the blood. The carbon dioxide is higher in the blood than it is in your alveoli, so it diffuses the opposite way. Okay, so that process is known as external respiration. Okay, it's a gas exchange between the alveoli and the blood and pulmonary capillaries, where oxygen diffuses in and carbon dioxide diffuses out of the blood. Okay, so now, and I kind of, I'm not going to talk about this part. You're, this book goes into a little more detail, but we're just going to ignore this thing here. But we do that gas exchange. Now what do we have to do? Well, now we have to think about transporting that oxygen. All right, and we kind of already know that. All right, the oxygen is going to diffuse into the blood. 98.5% of it is going to attach to the iron that's part of hemoglobin inside of the red blood cells. Okay, about 1.5% is dissolved in the blood plasma. So oxygen doesn't dissolve very well in the liquid part. So only about 1.5% stays in the plasma portion. Okay, so now you got that nice oxygenated blood. Where does it go? Well, we're going to bring it back to the heart. So this would represent the pulmonary veins. All right, it's going to go through the left side of the heart. We're going to pump it out. So this would represent, say, an aorta and then systemic arteries. And then we're entering the systemic, let's call this area here, the arterial. And now we're in a systemic capillary. So at systemic capillaries we do internal respiration with the tissue cells. So now we have to look at another set of numbers. So in oxygenated blood, you have about 100 millimeters mercury of oxygen. You have 40 millimeters mercury of carbon dioxide. Tissue cells are pretty low in oxygen, right? Because they've been utilizing it. So the oxygen level is about 40. Carbon dioxide levels are relatively high because they've been producing carbon dioxide. So now to understand this gas exchange, we just compare the numbers. And because oxygen is high in oxygenated blood, it'll diffuse into the cells. And because carbon dioxide is high in the cells, it'll diffuse into the blood. And now that blood becomes deoxygenated. But remember, it's carrying carbon dioxide. So what happens to the carbon dioxide? Well, 7% of it dissolves in plasma. So remember that solubility difference uh, where we talked about um, Henry's law. Because carbon dioxide has a higher solubility coefficient, you get more of it in the plasma, 7% compared to the 1.5% for oxygen. 23% of it actually attaches to hemoglobin and some other proteins, but it attaches different. It doesn't attach to iron. It actually attaches to the protein portion, the globin. Okay, so that's 30% of the carbon dioxide. So the majority of it actually undergoes a chemical reaction. And this is probably the most important chemical reaction that you'll learn about in anatomy and physiology. But carbon dioxide is going to react with water, okay? And this actually happens inside a red blood cell because inside the red blood cell, there's an enzyme. And the enzyme is called carbonic anhydrase. 
And that enzyme is going to combine carbon dioxide with water. And what you get is a new compound, a new molecule, which is called carbonic acid. Okay, and it's, it's an acid. So what's going to happen is it's going to cause the blood to become a little more acidic. And it's going to form what's called bicarbonate. Okay, so a little bit of acid base um, um, discussion here. An acid is a hydrogen or proton donator to the solution. So any molecule that releases this is considered an acid. Any molecule that kind of removes that from, the, from a solution is a base. So carbonic acid is an acid because it releases this hydrogen ion, which is also known as a proton. Now, where is the carbon dioxide? That's the question. Where did that carbon dioxide go? Well, notice it's kind of hidden. It's hidden inside of a new molecule called bicarbonate. So 70% of the carbon dioxide that goes into the blood gets converted to bicarbonate temporarily. All right. So this gets transported. So we go back to the heart. So this would represent systemic veins. We're going to pump to the lungs, so pulmonary artery. And now this reaction actually goes the other way. All right, we reverse this reaction so we can reform the uh, carbon dioxide and then release it into the alveolus. All right, so a lot of information on this slide. We just covered external respiration, which is right here, comparing these numbers. We covered transport of oxygen over here. Then we covered internal respiration by comparing these numbers. And then we covered carbon dioxide transport over on this side. All right, so a lot of information on this one single slide. All right, what's next? Um, this is kind of an extension of the previous slide. So this is nothing new, okay? What I try to do is just kind of get rid of all the fanciness of the previous slide uh, and just focus in on external respiration again and then internal respiration. So I'll remind you what external respiration is. It's when oxygen diffuses into the blood, carbon dioxide diffuses out of the blood into the alveoli. And these were the numbers we looked at. Okay, This is deoxygenated blood. This is the air in the lungs. Then we did all that transport here is internal respiration. Again, that's between the systemic capillaries and the tissue cells, where oxygen leaves the blood and goes into the cells, and carbon dioxide enters the blood. All right, so this kind of gets rid of the transport angle, the fancy picture, and we're just looking at the partial pressures of these gases at different locations. So if you recall back to that, um, uh, Dalton's law, right, the law of partial pressures, this is the reason why we need to learn about Dalton's law, because it explains why these gases move, because they have their very own pressure um, that drives the diffusion. Okay, I think that's a good place to stop that video. Uh, next video, we're going to talk about hemoglobin and oxygen a little more. Um, now, don't be scared of these graphs. Um, you actually don't really need to understand the graphs uh, if they don't help. Um, but we're going to talk about basically how does hemoglobin know to grab onto oxygen at the pulmonary capillaries, but then let go of it at the systemic capillaries. So we'll start a new video talking about that process.